morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. I think it's live. I'm waiting for it to spin. Good morning, everyone. I think it's live this time, but my computer still says it's spinning. Okay, now I think it's live. Good morning, everyone. Happy Monday, or if it's not morning on Monday when you're watching this, happy day, whatever it is. I am ready to read chapter two of I Thought It Was Just Me, But It Isn't. So I have my essential oils with me. I have my heart and I have a candle. I also have something to drink because it's a long chapter. So sit back, get comfortable. At some point I might get up and stretch a little bit myself. And um, phonics is not my thing. So if I mispronounce something, just kind of go with the flow. Um, it's a rainy day when I'm reading this. so. I'm a little under the weather, Weather, get it? Under the weather? <laughs> I'm trying to find some light humor to it. So sit back, relax. We're going to read this together. Um, and if you have the book, go ahead and pick up the book so you can read it with me. Or you can just, like I said, sit back, relax, and you can just listen to the words. So we're reading chapter two. It starts on page 31. And again, the book is... I thought it was just me, but it isn't. Shame, resiliency, and the power of empathy. How do we overcome shame? What can we do to avoid getting trapped in the shame web? The bad news is, the bad news is that there is no way to permanently rid ourselves of shame. As long as the connection is critical, the threat of disconnection that leads us to shame will always be part of our lives. The good news, however, is that we are all capable of developing shame resiliency. Again, by resiliency, I mean that ability to recognize shame when we experience it and move through it in a constructive way that allows us to maintain our authenticity and grow from our experiences. And in this process of consciously moving through our shame, we can, build we can build stronger and more meaningful connections with the people in our lives. In the same way we build an understanding of shame using definitions and descriptions, we have to build an understanding of resiliency. First, shame resiliency is not an all or nothing proposition. There are degrees of resiliency. To illustrate this, I developed the shame resiliency continuum. On the left-hand side of that continuum is shame. Under shame are the byproducts of shame, fear, blame, fear, blame, and disconnection. In order to get courage, compassion, and connection, we have to discover that what moves us from shame towards resiliency. To do that, we go back to the interviews with women about their experiences of shame. So, and that's the continuum that she's using. So on the left-hand side, there's shame, fear, blame, disconnection, shame, resiliency. Um, from 0, 3, 6, 9, 12 to empathy, courage, compassion, and connection. And I'm sure she'll explain that as we go along. Many of the women I interviewed shared their ideas and strategies for overcoming shame. I analyzed this information by asking, what is it that allows women to develop resiliency to shame? How do they move away from feeling fearful, blaming, and disconnected? And what enabled women to work their way out of shame? Over and over, the women I interviewed explained how empathy is the strongest antidote for shame. It's not just about having our, ne our needs for empathy met. Shame resiliency requires us to be able to respond empathetically to others. Women with high levels of shame resiliency were both givers and receivers of empathy. Do you remember the Petri dishes from high school science lab? Those little round dishes? If you put shame in a Petri dish and cover it with judgment, silence, and secrecy, it grows out of control until it consumes everything in sight. You have basically provided shame with the environment it needs to thrive. Huh, I like that. I'm going to say it again. If you put shame in a petri dish and cover it with judgment, silence, and secrecy, it grows out of control until it consumes everything in sight. Hmm. 
On the other hand, if you put shame in a petri dish and douse it with empathy, shame loses power and starts to fade. Empathy creates a hostile environment for shame. It can't survive. When I ask women to share experiences of how they recovered for shame, they describe situations in which they were able to talk about their shame with someone who expressed empathy. Women talked about the power of hearing someone say, I understand, I've been there. That's happened to me too. It's okay, you're normal. I understand what that's like. Like shame itself, the stories of resiliency shared a common core. When it comes to shame resiliency, empathy is at the center. Empathy, easier said than done. Real empathy takes more than words. It takes work. Empathy is not simply knowing the right thing to say to somebody who is experiencing shame. Our words are only as effective as our ability to be generally present and engage with somebody as she tells her story. Hmm, being present. We don't talk about that ever at Toivo, right? I define empathy as a skill or ability to tap into our own experiences in order to connect with an experience someone is relating to us. Another definition I like comes from a counselor textbook by writers Arne Ivy, Paul Peterson, and Mary Ivy. Um, they describe empathy as the ability to perceive a situation from the other person's perspective, to see, hear, and feel the unique world of the other. I believe that empathy is best understood as a skill because being empathetic or having the capacity to show empathy is not a quality that is innate or intuitive. We might be naturally sensitive to other, others, but there is more to empathy than sensitivity. Here's an example of how my friend Dawn's empathetic response helped me through a difficult shaming moment. Uh, I'm gonna say that again, the definition. I believe that empathy is best understood as a skill because being empathetic or having the capacity to show empathy is not a quality that is innate or intuitive. We have to practice it. So here's her example about Dawn's empathetic response. Every now and then, maybe three times a year, my worlds collide. There aren't enough small schedule conflicts. Um, there aren't small schedule conflicts. They are major collisions involving almost every one of my roles. One weekend in May, a couple of years ago, I had one of those collisions. My daughter was having her first ballet recital on the same weekend as the university commencement ceremony. The graduation ceremony and ballet recital overlapped by two hours. This was a huge stressor because I had been elected by the students to play an important role in the graduation ceremony. In addition to graduation and the ballet recital, that Sunday was Mother's Day and my entire family, my husband, Steve's family, were coming in from out of town for the festivities. The Friday leading into this monstrous weekend was my last day of teaching for the spring semester in Ellen's last day of school. For me, the last day means turning in the grades for my students. For Ellen, it means Teacher Appreciation Day. Steve and I had signed up to bring cookies for the Teacher Appreciation Party. In the midst of turning in grades, attending commencement practice, ballet dress re rehearsal, and getting the house ready for company, the cookies slipped my mind. Steve had dropped off Ellen on Friday morning and when I arrived to pick her up from school, the party sign-up sheet was still hanging on the front door. As I looked down and saw my name next to dessert, I panicked. I really liked and respect, respected Ellen's teacher. How could I have done this? I quickly cased the joint and decided to slink in, grab Ellen and sneak out un undetected. But as I was making my way down the hall, I came face to face with Ellen's teacher. I immediately went into my nervous high voice mode. Hi, how are you? How is the party? Ellen's teacher said, great, thanks. It was really fun. The food was great. Oh no, why did she say something about the food? She must know. I descended from high voice mode to liar mode and I said, so did Steve bring the cookies in this morning? Ellen's teacher looked puzzled and said, I'm not sure. I wasn't here when he dropped her off. 
So I, I stood on my tippy toes like I was looking over her shoulder, pointing my finger towards the back of the classroom, pretending like I was scanning the food table and said, oh, there they are, right there. Yum, they look great, great. I'm so glad he brought them on time. She looked at me kindly yet knowingly and said, I'll see you in a couple of weeks when the summer session starts. Have a good break. I got Ellen, literally slithered back to my car, buckled Ellen into her car seat, sat in the front seat, and tears just started pouring down my cheeks. As I sat there clinging to the steering wheel, I didn't know which was worse, that I had forgotten the cookies, that I had lied about bringing the cookies, or the shame of knowing Ellen's teacher must have been thinking, man, that was the worst working mom shuffle I've ever seen. Ellen looked a little worried, so I kept telling her, it's okay, mommy has a little cry in her, it's no big deal. I cried all the way home. As soon as I got to the door, I called my friend Dawn. She answered a la, a la caller ID, what's up? I confessed quietly and quickly. I just stole cookies from some parent at Ellen's school, then I lied to the teacher. Without skipping a beat, she said, what kind of cookies? I replied, no, really, listen to what I said. She stopped joking around and listened. When I was done, she, she said, look, you're doing the best you can. You have an impossible weekend in front of you. You're just trying to hold it together and you don't want Ellen's teacher to think that you don't appreciate her. That's pretty understandable given the fact that you like her and she's great with Ellen. It's not a big deal. I kept asking, are you sure? Are you sure? She finally said, look, I know you don't think you're, um, I know you don't think you're going, I know you don't think you're going hold it together. I don't, I know you don't think you're going to, you're going to hold it together for the next three days, but you will. You may not do it perfectly, but you're going to do it. I know that was probably really hard for you, but we have all been there and it's really okay. In that split second, the shame turned into something else, something I could handle, something that moved me from away from I'm so stupid, I'm a terrible mom to ah, that was pretty stupid. I'm an overwhelmed mom. She dropped just enough empathy into my Petri dish to make it start fading away. She wasn't judgmental. She didn't make me feel like I had to keep silent about my misstep. I really felt she had, she had heard me and cared about me. She validated my fear of barely hanging on, and she acknowledged how much I like Ellen's teacher. Most importantly, um, okay, she validated it and acknowledged Ellen's. Most importantly, she saw my world as I was experiencing, and she was able to express that to me. She didn't make it okay that I lied to Ellen's teacher, but she did make me feel accepted and connected. When I'm in shame, I can't be a good parent or a good teacher or a good mom or a good friend. If I had gone into the weekend feeling I was an unworthy mom and a liar who stole cookies from the mouths of babes, I wouldn't have made it. She also held back her laughter. I could laugh about it now, but when it was happening, it wasn't the least bit funny to me. She could have laughed and said, you're making a big deal out of nothing. It's fine. Don't worry. But that would not have been empathy. That might have, re that might have reflected how she felt, but it certainly would not ex express that she knew what I was experiencing. A joking, response might, a joking response might have left me feeling unheard, diminished, and even more ashamed because I was overreacting on top of stealing cookies. I wasn't in a place where I could have said, look, Dawn, I did this really terrible thing. I was just trying to hold it together, and I know I'm not perfect. I felt too fearful, trapped, and powerless. If Dawn had not extended such great empathy, I probably would have gone into the work weekend feeling very disconnected. I'm sure it would have been mere hours before I blamed Steve and blindsided him with a, you have no idea how stressful my life is fight. Not a good start to a big family weekend. Good morning, Stephanie. Empathy education. I have my cat sitting here listening to. Let's see if I can turn the 
thing just so you can see my cat who's sitting here listening. Say hi, Simba. Say hi, Sim. I'm glad you're listening. Okay, go back to reading. Empathy education. When I was in graduate school, almost every one of my classes included a component on increasing empathy skills. That is true for most people pursuing graduate degrees in professions like psychology, social work, counseling, and marriage and family therapy. In the growing body of empathy research, we are finding that successful le leaders often demonstrate high levels of empathy, that em empathy is related to academic and professional successes, that it, it can reduce aggression and prejudice, prejudice and increase altruism. Studies also show that it's a valid component in successful marriages and effective organizations. The bottom line is that empathy is essential for building meaningful, trusting relationship, which is something we all want and need. Given its power to overcome shame and its key role in building more different types of connections, empathy is something we would all be wise to learn and to practice. Fortunately, empathy is something that, that can be learned. Teresa Wiseman, a nursing scholar in England, identifies four defining attributes of empathy. They are, one, to be able to see the world as others see it. Two, to be non-judgmental. Three, to understand another person's feelings. And four, to communicate your understanding of that person's feelings. To understand the complexity of empathy, let's look at each attribute separately. By doing so, we can see how being authentic, authentic, uh, <laughs> authentic, empathetic is an incredible skill. Authentic, authenticity, authenticity, authentically thank you authentically empathetic is an incredible skill one that takes commitment and practice to be able to see the world as others see it sometimes the skill of trying to see the world as others see it is called perspective taking i find the lens meteor a very helpful way to understand perspective taking Metaphor, sorry, I find the lens metaphor a very helpful way to understand the perspective taking. We all see the world through multiple lenses. These lenses represent who we are and the perspective from which we view the world. Some of the lenses are constantly changing and some have been with us from the time we were born. Conflict is easy to understand when we think about the lens metaphor. 20 people can witness the same events. Hear, this, hear the same news story, or analyze the same situation. But 20 different sets of lenses cause them all to see, hear, and deduce very different things. In order to be empathetic, we must be willing to recognize and acknowledge our own lens and attempt to see the situation that someone is experiencing through her lens. For example, as a researcher, I need to understand how the world looks for the part participants I interview. I must work very hard not to see their stories through my lenses, but to listen as they describe what they see, feel, and experience. In the cookie example, Dawn was able to take my perspective on the situation and respond empathetically from, the per from that perspective. Children are very receptive to learning perspective taking skills. They are naturally curious about the world and how others operate in it. They are also far less invested in their perspective on being the right one. Those of us who were taught, taught perspective taking skills as children owe our parents a huge debt of gratitude. Those of us who, have, who were not introduced to that skill skill set when we were younger will have to work harder to acquire it as adults. Regardless of how hard we work, we are all humans and there are times when we push other people's lives and stories in front of our own lenses 
rather than honoring what they what they see through theirs. Unfortunately, when it comes to responding empathetically to someone who is experiencing shame, we're more likely to hold on to our own perspective if we have similar shame issues. If Dawn had recently had her own mother shame experience, she might not have been able to put her lens down long enough to pick up mine. My cookie story might have hit too close to home. Over identifying with someone's experience can be as much a barrier to perspective taking as not identifying at all. While perspective taking is not easy, it can be accomplished. It takes commitment, effort, the courage to make a lot of mistakes, and the willingness to be confronted about those mistakes. It also requires believing that we, what we see in one view of the world, it also requires believing that what we see is one view of the world, not the thought of you. That's a, kind of interesting to think about that because it's really hard to look at another person's worldview. We talk a lot about worldview and it's looking at another person's worldview because that's how they see what's happening in, in the world. Um, but trying to put ourselves in that situation sometimes is hard. And for me, I could think of, good morning, Julie. Uh, I could think of like the election time and how a lot of people had a difficult time putting, um, including myself, putting myself in another person's shoes, especially if they didn't view the election the same way as I did. Anyways, I digress. To be non-judgmental, one of the greatest challenges we will face on this path to developing empathy will be to overcome the habit of judging others. We all do it and most of us do it do it all the time. Judging has become such a part of our thinking pattern that we are rarely even aware of why and how we do it. It takes a great deal of conscious thinking or mindfulness to even bring the habit of judging into our awareness. Often, our need to judge others is deeply motivated by our need to evaluate our own abilities, beliefs, and values. According to research conducted by Sidney Schwarger and Marion Peterson, judging others allows us to appraise and compare our abilities, beliefs, and values against the abilities, abilities, beliefs, and values of others. This explains why we most often judge others around the issues that are important in our lives. For example, in my interviews with women, I heard over and over how women constantly feel judged by other women when it comes to appearances and motherhood. On the other hand, every man I interviewed talked about how other men are constantly sizing up each other's level of financial success, intellect, and physical, me physical strength as, a measure, as measures of power. Sometimes when suffocated under our culture's, culture's, our culture's rigid gender ideals, we mistakenly believe we can escape the pressure by judging others. Look, compared to her, I'm great. And for me, being a woman, I can't talk about being a man because I don't know what that's like. But me being a woman, I see that sometimes, a lot of times, and I work so hard on it every day about how hard we judge ourselves and the women around us. Um, and I, I've had some great teachers in my life point out about how, you know, it works so much better when we don't judge ourselves so harshly in the women around us because we'll support each other as women versus um, compete against each other as women. Shame, fear, and anxiety are all major in incubators of judgment. When we are in our own shame about an issue or when we are feeling anxious, threatened, or fearful about an issue, refraining from judgment can seem impossible. In my interview interviews, there were three topics that constantly elicited, elicited painful, harsh judgment on the part of the participants. Surprisingly, they were not abortion, politics, religion, or any of the big issues of the day. They were the issues that hit closest to home. 
addiction, parenting, and affairs. In other areas, women felt remorse about being so judgmental towards others, but when it came to those, these issues, women felt absolutely justified in their own angry judgment. For example, I was talking to one woman who was telling me how shaming it is for her when her parents criticize the way she raises her kids. She told me, when it comes to parenting, everyone's a critic. Very few people ever tell you what you what you're doing well. They just find fault in everything you do. She explained how she was working with a parenting coach and reading books and working really hard and that she just likes someone to acknowledge how hard she's trying. Then she went on to say, here's the thing. I work very hard to be a good parent. I try not to get angry and yell. I try not to lose my patience. When I do lose it and I get angry, I feel really bad. I never hit or say hurtful things, but sometimes I get angry. I work really hard to be a good mom. If you're that mom who hits, grabs, pushes, or jerks your child around, I don't want to know you. If you spank your kids, you probably have we probably have nothing in common. If you say mean, hurtful things to your kids, I don't want to hear it and I don't want to be around it. Given her own sensitivity being to being judged, it would be easy to label her criticisms of another as self-righteousness. But I'm not sure that's accurate, at least not in this example. I saw fear and shame more than anger. This is a vicious cycle. The judgment of others leaves us feeling hurt and shameful, so we judge others as a way to make ourselves feel better. As I interviewed more and more women about this phenomenon, I realized that to move away from judging, we must be very mindful of why we are thinking, feeling, about what we are thinking, feeling, and saying. We can't fake non-judgment. It's in our eyes, our voices, in our body language. Real empathy requires us to stay out of judgment, and that's very difficult if we're not self-aware. We must know and understand ourselves before we can know and understand someone else. To understand another person's feelings. In order to do this, we must be in touch with our own feelings and emotions, and we must and we need to be comfortable in the larger world of emotions and feelings. For many, this world is completely foreign. It's a complex world of new language and thinking. For example, if we can't recognize the subtle but important differences between disappointment and anger in ourselves, it's virtually impossible to do this with others. If we can't recognize and name fear when we're feeling it, how can we, how, when we're feeling it, how will we empathetically connect to someone else who is in fear? Emotions are often difficult to recognize and even harder to name. This is especially true if we weren't given the vocabulary and skills required to navigate these, this emotional world when we were growing up, which unfortunately is the case for most of us. In the example with Dawn, she made it clear to me that she knew what I was feeling when she said, you're just trying to hold it together. And I know you don't think you're going to make it. She didn't have to say. I hear that you're experiencing high levels of anxiety coupled with a fear of disappointing others. She could have said that she's a social worker, but she didn't need to. And I'm not sure even I'm not even sure that it would have felt as powerful to me. What she did need to do was convey to me to, that she understood my perspective and my feelings about the situation. Communicate your understanding of that person's feelings. For me, this last step can sometimes feel risky. I know that's I know that's when I teach empathy skill to graduate students that it's often where they stumble, where we all stumble. Let's imagine that's don't that Dawn misunderstood my feelings or didn't fully get my perspective, and her response was more along the lines of, I know it's so frustrating. Steve could have remembered to bring those damn cookies to school. Why do we always have to remember everything? Would that have permanently damaged this opportunity for empathetic exchange? Absolutely not. 
again, empathy isn't just about the words. It's about fully engaging with somebody and wanting to understand. If I knew that Dawn was engaged but missed my point, I probably would have said something like, no, I'm not pissed off at Steve. I'm freaking out because I screwed up and this weekend hasn't even started yet. Now, if Dawn had not been engaged and had not really been listening, I might not have bothered to stay connected and to keep seeking what I needed from her. I might have just accepted her comment about Steve and said, yeah, the pressure is all on mothers and moved on. When I told her that it wasn't funny, she got quiet and I knew she was listen, listening and wanted to hear me. Empathy, courage, and compassion. Stories require voices to speak to them and ears to hear them. Stories only foster connection when there is both someone to speak and someone to listen. In sharing my work on women in shame, I hope to accomplish two things. Give voice to the voiceless and give ears to the earless. Ooh, I have never heard that, ears to the earless. My first goal is to share the complex and important stories that women often keep to themselves because of shame. I want to share these voices because their stories are our stories. They deserve to be told. My second goal is to, re to relay these stories in a way that allows us to hear them. Often the problem isn't with the voices, but rather with our ears. The voices are frequently there, singing, screaming, yearning to be heard. We don't hear them because fear and blame muffle the sounds. Courage gives us a voice and compassion gives us an ear. Hmm. Without both, there is no opportunity for empathy and connection. Again, I'm not talking about um, bravery or heroics. I'm talking about ordinary courage. The courage to tell our stories from the heart. It's a courage to call Dawn and tell her about the cookies. Dawn had to practice compassion. She had to be willing to make room in her world for my painful experience. In the next two sections, we'll explore these ideas of courage and compassion separately. But first, I want to emphasize the importance of how they work together. Empathy and courage. In the introduction, I talked about the important history of the word courage. While it's certainly not unusual for the meaning of words to change over, times, over time, many believe that the changing definition of courage mirrors a cultural shift that has diminished the value of women's voices and stories. In the late 1990s, 150 therapists gathered in Vermont to talk about courage and the world's evolution, and the word's evolution. Elizabeth Bernstein, a therapist and one of the conference organizers, explained that courage is not just about slaying the dragon, but about being true to yourself and speaking your mind. Reverend Jane Spatz, a Presbyterian minister and gay lesbian rights activist who attended the conference, Reverend Spar told the story of St. George and St. Martha to illustrate, illustrate the different ways we think about courage. She explained that St. George slew the dragon because the dragon was bad, but St. Martha tamed and befriended the dragon. She went on to say, this is one of our feminist myths that has been lost. Courage could mean to slay the dragon, but it could also mean to tame our fears. But could it also mean to tame our fears? It's a question, not a statement. When I heard Susan, Kayla, Teresa, Sandra, Sandra, Sandra Jillian and the rest of the women I interviewed tell their stories, I was struck by their openness. But as I listened, I realized it was more about the openness. It wasn't, it was more than the openness, it was courage. Every woman who participates in this research willingly embraces her fear in order for us to learn. When we tell our stories, we change the world. I know that sounds dramatic, but I believe it. We'll never know how our stories might change someone's life. Our children's, our friends, our parents, our partners, or maybe that of a stranger who hears a story down the line or reads it in a book. But courage, especially the ordinary courage we need to speak out, it's not, simp 
It's not simple or easily attained. So often we hear people say, just tell your story or speak your mind. It's much more complicated than that. Sometimes we face real threats and consequences when we speak our minds and tell our stories. In fact, as you start to learn about the four elements of shame resiliency, you'll see that most of us will have to do a lot of work before we can get to that element of reaching out and sharing our stories. Sometimes compassion is listening to someone's story and other times it's sitting with her in her fear about not being ready to share. In her article on ordinary courage in girls and women's lives, Annie Roger writes, one way to understand uh, the etymology of courage is to consider its history as a series of losses. Over the course of five centuries, from 1051 to 1490, courage was cut off from its source in time, in the heart and in feelings. In other words, courage was slowly disassociated from what traditional Western cultures considered feminine qualities and came to mean the quality of mind that shows itself in, faces, in facing danger without fear, fear or shrinking. A definition associated with the bra bravery and her heroism of boys and men. The pattern of losses in the history of the word courage seems to reflect increasingly invisibility of girls and women's courage in Western culture. Without courage, we cannot tell our stories. When we don't tell our stories, we miss the opportunity to experience empathy and move towards shame resiliency. Empathy and compassion. If empathy is a skill or ability to tap into our own experiences in order to connect with an experience someone is relating to us, compassion is the willingness to be open to this process. To prepare for writing this book, I read everything I could find on compassion. I ultimately found a powerful fit between the stories I heard in the interviews and the work of Amer American Buddhist nun uh, Pembra Chopra. Or, I always say her name, Pema Chandra. I always say her name wrong, but in her book, The Places That Scare You, um, Chandra writes, when we practice generating compassion, we can, exper we can expect to experience the fear of our pain. Compassion practice is daring. It involves learning to relax and allows ourselves to move towards what scares us, like reading out loud. <laughs> the trick to doing this is to stay with emotional distress without tightening into aversion. To let fear soften us rather, rather than harden into res resistancy. When we hear and watch someone tell us the story behind her shame, we can lean into that discomfort of her pain. When Allison, the young woman whose mother committed suicide, tells us about her mother's death and what that meant to her, we can sit with her in that pain. Can we sit with her in that pain? When the woman whose son is struggling in addiction tells us about her pain, can we be with her in her shame? Or do we feel the need to make it better or redirect the conversation? If we're willing to be open and present, we are, wi we are willing to practice compassion. Uh, I, write, I write practice because I believe compassion is a commitment and takes constant practice. Sandra Pema um, teaches that we must be honest and forgiving about when and how we shut down. Without justifying or condemning ourselves, we do the courageous work of opening to suffering. This could be the pain that comes when we put up barriers or the pain of opening our heart to our own sorrow or that of another being. We learn as much about doing this from our failures as we do from our successes. In cultivating compassion, we draw from the wholeness of our experience, our suffering, our empathy, as well as our cruelty and terror. terror. <clears throat> 
It has to be this way. Compassion is not a relationship between the healer and the wounded. It's a relationship between equals. Only when we know our darkness well can we be present with the darkness of others. Compassion becomes real when we recognize our shared humanity. Better late than never. <clears throat> I'm frequently asked if I think that it's ever too late to express empathy. Can we go back when we miss that opportunity to be empathetic? Interest, interest, interestingly, many women spoke about this during the interviews and the resounding answer was better late than never. The impact of late empathy might be different from what we, we'd experience if somebody responded empathetically right away, but the potential for strengthening the relationship is still there. Let me give you a personal example. I love her personal examples. Recently, I was eating dinner with a friend. We both, have newborn, we both had newborns at the time. She stayed at home with her baby and her toddler, and I was getting ready to go back to work. She was telling me about the terrible sadness she felt about the fact that she and her husband were probably not going to have any more children. She explained that even though having two young children was overwhelming at times, she had always wanted three or four and that she was really having a difficult time letting go of the visions of a family. As she was talking, I was listening. However, the voices in my head were drowning her out. Oh my God, what is she thinking? Two is awesome. I'm so happy. This is perfect for me. My response to her was something like, two is perfect. It gets a lot more demanding when they get into elementary school. Plus, you can go back to work or graduate school or something. She looked kind of shocked by my reply and stumbled to find the right words. Well, I'm enjoying staying home with them right now. And if I had another child, it wouldn't stop me from going back to school or work, even if I even want to do that. I'm not afraid of working or going back to school with three or four kids. I scoffed, well, you should be afraid. She very quickly changed the subject, and after doing the uncomfortable surface chat for the next 10 minutes, we both got into our cars and headed home. I felt horrible. Two minutes after we drove out of the parking lot, I called her on her cell phone. Where are you? She sounded surprised. I'm at the corner. Why? Are you okay? I told her I needed to talk to her and asked if she could pull into the gas station across the street. I pulled in behind her, walked up to her car. She got out and I said and asked, what's wrong? I explained, I need to apologize for what I said and what I didn't say. When you told me that you were having a hard time about possibly not having more kids, I wasn't there for you. I'm really so sorry. I want to understand and be there for you. I can tell you you're really sad. Will you give me another chance? I'm lucky. She was courageous. She started crying and said, yeah, what you said felt bad, and I am really sad. This is incredibly hard for me, and I started crying. We talked about it for a while, then we hugged. She thanked, thanked me for pulling over, and I thanked her for accepting my apology and, as important, giving me another chance. It takes a lot of courage to share your hurt with someone. It takes even more courage to do it twice, especially after they shut you down the first time. After reflecting on this situation, I finally figured out that that when she started talking to me about not having more children, I instantly heard the grief in her voice and that scared me. In fact, it shut down my compassion. I could have handled anger or fear or maybe even shame, but not grief. I was experiencing high levels of stress and anxiety about my book deadline. I was also in my own grief about the time that I would be away from my new new baby as I was heading back to work. I filtered her story through my emotion. In other words, my own stuff just got in my way of my compassion. There are times when we will miss the opportunity to be empathetic. Mental health professionals often call these empathetic failures. There are there are also times when the people around us will not be able to give us what we need. 
when this happens on occasion, most of our, our relationships can survive and even thrive if we work to repair the empathetic failures. However, most relationships can't withstand, withstand repeated failed attempts at empathy. This is especially true if we find ourselves constantly, constantly rationalizing and justifying why we can't be empathetic with someone or why someone is not offering us the empathy we need. I could have easily told myself, you know what, she needed to hear that. She's crazy for thinking about another baby so soon. I'm sorry if it hurt her feelings, but someone had to tell her like it is. And my friend could have responded to my request for her to let me in again by saying, no, it's not a big deal, I'm fine. Developing our empathy skills is not easy. Shame is a complex problem that requires a complex solution. Each of the four attributes of empathy requires us to know ourselves, act authentically, and engage with others using our minds and our hearts. This act of empathy produces resiliency to shame by countering, countering fear and disconnection. Okay, I'm standing up for a minute. Ooh. Okay, empathy and connection. For women, connection is about mutual support, sharing experiences, acceptance, and belonging. As you can see in this illustration on page 48, individuals and groups that may enforce the expectations that create shame in one area can turn out to be a valued source of connection building in other areas. In relationships, we are given threads. We can use these threads to weave webs that trap others or to weave blankets of support. It's our choice. For example, a colleague might be a tremendous source of connection around shame experiences that develop from professional situations, yet he or she might make, make yet he or she might make comments or reinforce stereotypes that trigger shame in other areas like motherhood, motherhood or sexual orientation. So connection network, I'm gonna to try to show you this. This is the picture she has. And in the middle is empathy, courage, compassion, and connection. On top is self, on the bottom is partner, left is friends, right is family. And there's people holding like the circle and next to the people is faith community colleagues, community members, health professionals, teachers, membership groups, educators and mentors and connection network affirmations, acceptance, belonging. Researchers and activists, research, research, uh, researchers and activists, Lauren I'm not pronouncing that, Edith Ann Lewis's concept of connection captures its ability to counter the messages, expectations, and stereotypes that form the shame web. They write, connection serves two pur purposes, the development of social support networks and the, cr the creation of power through interaction. Involvement with others is similar in similar situation provides individuals with a means for acquiring and providing mutual aid with the opportunity to learn new skills through role modeling with strategies for dealing with likely institutional reprisals and with a potential power base for future actions. When we develop and practice empathy, courage, and compassion, we move from disconnection to connection. This creates the, the liberation we need to enjoy the things we value rather than be imprisoned by what others expect. When we are ready to start practicing empathy, we should start with our own most important relationship. Ha! Huh. Guess which one? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm all the way down. Guess which one she's going to talk. When we are ready to start practicing empathy, we should start with our most important relationship, the one we have with ourselves. I write about self-empathy in chapter nine, but I want to address it here as well. It is important to understand that we cannot practice empathy with others unless we can be empathetic with ourselves. 
If, for example, we judge ourselves harshly and are incapable or unwilling to acknowledge our own emotions, we will struggle in our relationship with others. If we make a mistake and our self-talk is, I'm so stupid, I can't do anything right, then we are more likely to turn to our child or partner who has made a mistake and convey the same feeling, even if we don't say them out loud. Empathy and connection requires us to know and accept ourselves before we can know and accept others. Barriers to empathy. Sympathy versus empathy. She's got a really good um, cartoon video about the difference between sympathy and empathy, if you have a chance to go and check it out. Barriers to empathy, sympathy versus empathy. When we talk about empathy, we often confuse it with sympathy. Yet during the interviews, women were very clear about the difference between sympathy and empathy. When they talk about their ability to overcome shame, they clearly pointed to empathy, sharing their feelings with someone who would understand and relate to what they were saying. Conversely, women use words like hate, despise, and can't stand to describe their feelings about sympathy seeking, looking for sympathy or being asked for sympathy. Empathy seeking, empathy seeking is driven by the need to know that we are not alone. We need to know that other people have experienced similar feelings and that our experiences don't keep us from being accepted and affirmed. Empathy helps us move away from shame towards resiliency. Sympathy, on the other hand, can actually exacerbate shame. To illustrate the difference between sympathy and empathy, let's go back to the cookie story. Hold on one second. After a week, after a week, about a week after my conversation with Dawn, hold on. About a week after my conversation with Dawn, Steve and I were eating dinner with some friends who really appeared to be the super working parents. During dinner, they told a story about parents who had their gall, <clears throat> who had the gall to bring sugary store-bought treats in plastic bags to their seven-year-old son's homeroom party. Of course, of course, I'm one notch below store-bought treats. I'm the treat thief. I react to their story by saying, well, when I remember to bring treats, they're normally store-bought. It's a rare occasion that I have the time to make something homemade. They gave me the quasi-friendly upside-down story like they were thinking, hmm, let's make a note of this. So for some reason, this response compelled me to tell the cookie appropriation story. Maybe I wasn't thinking to test the water, giving their comments about store-bought snacks. Could we possibly... Could we possibly belong to their club? Dawn had shown empathy, but she wasn't a mother at the time. Maybe I was seeking redemption from these super parents if they could understand I must be okay. It was one of those stories you begin telling with enthusiasm and a strong commitment to be genuine, but in the middle, when you sense it's not going over very well, you skip the worst details, try to wrap it up as quickly as possible. I don't know what I was expecting, but I certainly didn't expect, to, didn't expect them to literally gasp, put their hands over their eyes like looking, into, at, looking at me might blind them. When I was done, they shook their head in unison and looked at me with pity. She leaned towards me and said, oh my God, that's so horrible. I can't imagine doing that. I'm so sorry. Their sympathy slapped me across the face. Like all sympathy, it said, I'm over here and you're over there. I'm sorry for you and I'm sad for you. And while well, I'm sorry that happened to you, let's be clear, I'm over here. That's not compassion. In most cases, when we give sympathy, we don't reach across to understand the world as others see it. We look at others from our world and feel sorry or sad for them. Inherent in sympathy is, I don't understand your world but from this view, things look pretty bad. Looking back, I think the worst thing that she said to me was probably, I can't imagine doing that. 
When she said that, it was very clear that she didn't see the world as I saw. She saw my experiences, my experience from her world. And again, that's not empathy. Secondly, <clears throat> I certainly felt judged. I heard nothing that told me she understood my feelings. And in no way did she communicate her understand of my ex understanding of my experience. When our need for empathy is met with sympathy, it is often it can often send us deeper into shame. We feel even more alone and separated. Empathy is about connection. Sympathy is about separation. Sympathy seeking. On the flip side of responding to empathy seeking with sympathy is the com complex issue of trying to express empathy when someone is seeking sympathy. One sentiment underlying sympathy seeking is often feeling sorry for me because I'm the one this is happening to, or my situation is worse than everyone else's. This naturally creates disconnection and separation. People seeking sympathy are not looking for empathy or evidence of shared experiences. They are searching for confirmation of their uniqueness. When I talk about sympathy seeking in workshops, the audience members usually start to look agitated and crusty. I learned early on how to handle or how to diffuse the situation. I just have to ask how many of you know someone who is sympathy seeking and are thinking of that person as I describe this concept. Without fail, hands shoot up across the room. The participants are anxious to talk about the person they envision and how irritating he or she is. I've had many people tell me that they feel manipulated and controlled by the people in their lives who are sympathy seeking. I even hear these descri descriptions from therapists who often feel stuck when they're working with somebody who's in sympathy seeking mode. It is not unusual to feel resentful or dismissive when somebody requests our sympathy. When people look for sympathy, it feels like a no-win situation. On the other hand, they are telling us that they have it worse than anyone and no one could understand. But on the other, on one hand, they're telling us that they have it worse than anyone and no one could understand. But on the other hand, they are looking for our validation. I interviewed one woman who said, in my family, my husband is the only one who is entitled to have it hard. Even if I'm going through something just like him or something worse, the attention needs to be on him. It's not asking for help. He's not asking for help. He just wants me to tell him that his life is hard and unfair and worse than mine. He thinks he works harder, sleeps less, and does more. Trust me, he doesn't. Sometimes the best we can do with someone who is sympathy seeking is to fake a, yeah, that's really hard, or wow, sounds rough. But on the inside, we're probably thinking, please get over it, or hey, that's nothing, or enough of the pity party. Sometimes these requests for sympathy make us so angry and resentful that we can't even muster a benign response. However, they play out. It's easy to see why these exchanges really produce real connection and understanding. While sympathy seeking is often about casting ourselves in a unique light, we can certainly communicate feeling alone and feeling like the only one without sympathy seeking. What separates, hold on. What separates sympathy and empathy is our motivation for sharing struggles. And ironically, our motivation for sympathy seeking is often shame. My first year as a doctoral student, I did a lot of sympathy seeking. Unsurprisingly, the more I sought sympathy, the more alone I felt. I was so overwhelmed by my classes that the shame and fear of potential failure was too real and, and imminent for me to say I'm drowning. I feel like I'm in over my head and if I quit or fail, my life is going to be over. While that sentiment is relatable for almost everyone I know, I just wasn't in the place where I could clearly understand, much less articulate my true feelings. I would say you have no idea what the pressure is like. It's not like getting an undergraduate degree or the office. For the people around me, this translated into 
this is more important than anything you've ever done, so feel really sorry for me. When friends and family responded to my plea with half-hearted sympathy, I would dig myself in even more by thinking, I knew it. It's not like any of them. I knew it. It's not like any of them is in a doctoral program. When we find ourselves seeking sympathy, it is helpful to step back and think about what we are really feeling. What is it we're seeking and what we really need? On the other hand, when we are asked to give sympathy, we have to decide if we want to simply give it and move on or really try to connect and develop empathy. If we want to develop connection and understanding, sometimes the best way to practice compassion is to say, it sounds like you're in a hard place. Tell me more about it. Or you're right. I don't know what that's like. What is it like? Help me understand. Sometimes when I facilitate groups, I'll even ask, I'll even say to someone, you are telling us that no one could understand, yet you're asking us to understand. What should we do? We want to connect, but if you're telling us it's impossible, but we want to connect, but you're telling us it's impossible. Often a dialogue grounded in these questions can lead us to genuine empathy and connection. Those are tough conversations to have though. Stacking the deck. Another barrier to developing empathy is a phenomenon I call stacking the deck. In many ways, this is related to sympathy-seeking behavior. Over and over, women describe how devastated they were after they finally mustered the courage to reach out to someone. Then they had their story trumped by the you think you got a bad crowd or card. Sorry. I'll see your drunk mother and raise you a drug addict sister. I'll see your unmarried and 30 and raise you a single mom. When we compete to see whose situation is worse, whose oppression is the most real or whose ism is the worst, we lose sight of the fact that most of us struggle, our struggles stem from the same place, powerlessness and disconnection. If we spend our resources attempting to outdo one another, competing for last place or stepping on each other to climb out of shame, shame will always prevail. It will prevail because being told that's nothing can make us feel like nothing. Most of us will, feel, will feed shame with our silence before we risk sharing something that we fear might not be as bad as somebody else's situation or bad enough to warrant empathy. Lorraine, a woman in her early 20s, talked about the shame she felt when she finally opened up about her college roommate when she finally opened up with her college roommate about the fact that her teenage brother was schizophrenic and had a history of violence before he was stabilized on his medication. She had asked me about him several times. I finally told her about him and I started to cry. I explained that I'm not ashamed of him, but I am ashamed that my parents have him living in a treatment center. She didn't say anything back to me. When I asked her what happened next in the conversation, Lorraine said my, my roommate just stood up and said, that's no big deal. Kendall, their sweet mate, little sister was killed in a car wreck. That's got to be way worse. Then she walked into the bathroom. I felt so small. I wish I'd never said anything at all. We don't know why Lorraine's roommate was unable to or unwilling to respond empathetically. Perhaps she was fearful about the level of emotion she saw in Lorraine, or maybe she just didn't want to know. There are many reasons. Let's look at a couple of other common responses as examples of how easy it is to skip right over empathy. I feel like my marriage is falling apart right now. Right. I feel like my marriage is falling apart right before my very eyes. Response A. Oh no, you and Tim are a great couple. I'm sure everything will be fine. This is the you have not been heard and and they're not going and they're not going their response. Response B, at least you have a marriage. John and I haven't had a real marriage for year for years. I call this the 
I'm bringing it back to me response. It lacks concern and empathy completely. There aren't many hard and fast rules about empathy, but this might be one. At least is not a good lead in for an empathetic response. I had a miscarriage. At least you know you can get pregnant. I've been diagnosed with cancer. At least you caught it early. My sister's really struggling with her alcoholism. At least it's not drugs. This at least response is primarily about our own discomfort. At leasting someone is equivalent to shutting her down. Response C, I'm really sorry. This could be a very lonely place. Is there anything I can do? This response demonstrates empathy. It's not judgmental. It's an attempt to reflect back how someone might be feeling, even if she's not feeling lonely. She has a chance to respond, and she knows you are trying to understand her world. <clears throat> the pressure to get it right or to say the perfect thing can be the biggest barrier to empathy and compassion. We start to experience anxiety about saying the right thing, and before we know, we've missed the opportunity to, empath to be empathetic and compassion compassionate. We diminish, change the subject, or walk away. Lorraine's roommate didn't have to say anything magical. She could have just said, gosh, that must be hard for everyone in your family, or that would be hard for me too. How is your brother doing in the center? Often just hearing about somebody's shaming experience can cause us to want to shield ourselves. We don't want to hear it. It's too painful just to listen. One reason empathy and compassion are so powerful is the fact that they say to someone, I can hear this. This is hard, but I can be in this space with you. Digging deep. <clears throat> Another way we avoid empathetic connection is by convincing ourselves that we really can't we that we can't really understand experiences that we haven't actually had. Lorraine's roommate might be might have thought, I have no idea what it's like to have a brother with a mental illness. How am I supposed to know what to say? The bottom line is this. If we want to build connect, connection networks, networks that really help us move from shame to empathy, we cannot reserve empathy for the select few who have had experiences that mirror our own. We must learn to move past the situations and events that people are describing in order to move towards the feelings and emotions they're experiencing. For example, one of the participants spoke about the difficulties of being an African-American medical student. Here's how she described her experience. For me, shame is about being too black at school and too white for my friends and families at home. In medical school, everyone looks at me like I don't belong. I feel like they wonder if I'm the affirmative action case. It's not just about race either. I'm also from a pretty poor family. I went to college on scholarships. Most of my friends didn't even finish high school. When I'm at school, it's clear that I'm different. When I go home, they give me a hard time. One time my grandmother said, leave the white coat and that white attitude at the door. Don't be thinking your Marcus will be around here. Even though I act the same, they assume I think I'm better than they are. I don't. I just want to feel like I fit in somewhere. Now, I would venture to say the majority of us are not black medical school students. Most of us have not had that experience of straddling the very white male world of medicine and black family life. If we read her quote and we walk away thinking, wow, that sounds pretty tough, but I can't really relate to that, then we've missed an opportunity for empathy. This is critical because our level of shame resiliency depends equally on both our ability to receive empathy and our ability to extend empathy. On Missing the Opportunity to be Empathetic, Jean Baker Miller and Irene Stever, researchers and therapists from the Stone Center, write the phenomenon of empathy is basic to all our relationships. Either we deal with the feelings that are inevitably present in our interactions by turning to each other or we turn away. If we turn away from others without conveying recognition of the existence of their feelings, we inevitably leave the other person's diminished 
the other person diminished in some degree. We also are inevitably turning away from engaging fully with our own experience, dealing with it in a less than optimal way that is in isolation. If we, we, if we reach far enough into our own experiences, most of us can relate to trying to keep one foot in one world and the other foot in the other world. Most of us know what that feels like. When I open myself to hearing beyond the struggles of balancing medical school and family life, I immediately think about trying to keep one foot in motherhood and one foot in a very male-defined academic world. When I'm in one world, the message is, it's great that you're a mother, but we don't, don't really want to see any evidence of that around here. If your child is sick, you still need to be here. If their daycare closes, we would prefer you not bring them here. So I have one foot in this world where I'm allowed to be a mother, but only if it doesn't just detract from my focus on academics. And my other foot is in motherhood where it's okay that I work as pursuing something I think is important, but not if it disrupts anything that goes on at home. On some days I can stay bound. On other days I feel fearful that the world would drift so far apart that I'll end up losing my footing in both. The worst feeling for me is that the sense that I'm the only person about to be split in half. I'm not an African-American medical student, but I have had similar experiences of terms of trying to balance two worlds that often seem mutually exclusive. For me, this experience makes me feel lonely, unworthy, and like something is wrong with me. So when I read her statement about shame, while I certainly do not want to project my experience onto her, I do want to be able to touch in myself something of the emotion that she might be feeling so that I can try to connect with what she's saying. I don't have to tell her my story. I certainly wouldn't say, I know exactly what you mean, because I don't. I may know what, it's, what it feels like to try to balance different roles, but I don't know what racism feels like. I don't know how exhausting it is to have constantly shift from one culture to another to fit in. I don't believe we can fully understand racism, sexism, homophobia, ageism, or any form of oppression until we've experienced it. However, I do believe that we are all responsible for constantly developing our understanding of oppression and recognizing our part in perpetrating it. Empathy is a powerful place to start. So often I find that our feeling of unearned privilege kills, kill empathy. By unearned privilege, I mean the privilege afforded us similar, our, uh, by unearned privilege, I mean the privileges afforded us simply because we are white or straight or members of certain groups. We get stuck in what I call privilege shame. This is very different pr from privilege guilt or white guilt. It's appropriate to feel guilty over forwarding a racist email or telling a hurtful joke. Guilt can motivate change. Guilt, guilt helps us reconcile our choices with our values. Shame doesn't help. If we feel ashamed because we don't know how to relate to someone who is different or connect with someone who faces unfair discrimination, we get stuck. If we think I'm a bad person because I can't relate to her or I'm a bad person because I have this and they don't, we get paralyzed. For me, I come to a place in my life where unlearned pr prejudice is more important than avoiding situations where I might be accused of saying or doing the wrong thing. I've learned that it is better for me to accept the fact that I struggle with many of the same learned biases that other people do. They have allowed me to spend my energy unlearning and challenging my prejudice rather than proving that I don't have any. When we are honest about our struggles, we are much more, when we are honest about our struggles, we are much less likely to get stuck in shame. This is critical because shame diminishes our capacity to practice empathy. Ultimately, feeling shame about privilege actually perpetrates racism, sexism, 
heterosism, heterosexism, classism, ageism, etc. I don't have to know exactly how you feel. I just have to touch a part in my life that opens me up to hearing your experience. If I could touch that place, I stay out of judgment and I can reach out with empathy. This is where both personal and social healing can begin. Imagine what it would be like if we could reach out to folks who have had our exact experiences. Peer support. We talk about that a lot. We would all be very much, imagine what it would be like if we could only reach out to folks who have had our exact experiences. We would all be very much alone. Life experiences are like fingerprints. No two are exactly alike. Furthermore, even if we have had what we believe is the exact same experience as someone else, we can never know exactly how they feel. Going back to the lens metaphor, there are just too many variables for any of us to experience anything the exact same way. Below are five more shame experiences from my research. Under each, I've labeled some of the emotions that I've heard in the interviews, and I've, and I've posed empathy questions that might help us connect with that experience. Can one, give me one second. Eleven, eleven. say hi to the angels. Experience. When I think of shame, I think of being sexually abused when I was growing up. I think about what that's done to my life and how it changed everything. It's not just the abuse itself. It's everything you have to deal with the, with the rest of your life. It's like you feel different from anyone else. Nothing is ever normal for you. Everything is about that. I'm not allowed just to have a regular life. That is the thing that made me who I am, and I'm so, and so everything is stained by that. That's what shame is for me. Emotions, feeling labeled, dismissed, misunderstood, reduced. Emotions might include grief, loss, frustration, and anger. Dig deep. Have you ever been defined by an experience? Found yourself unable to get out from under a reputation or an incident? Have you ever been unfairly labeled? Have you ever had people attribute your behaviors to an identity you don't deserve? Have you ever fought to overcome something only to find others less than willing to move past it? Experience. I'm ashamed because I always hate my life. No matter what I have and no matter how much I have, I always, I'm always disappointed with my life. I always think to myself, if I only had this or that, I'd be happy. I get this or that, and I'm still not happy. It's a horrible part of me, and I don't know how to make it go away. I can't talk about it with anyone because everyone is sick of hearing how disappointed I am about everything all the time. That's what's shameful to me. I just can't never seem to pull it all together and find happiness. Emotions, stuck, angry, overwhelmed, disappointed, confused, lost, alone. Dig deep. Do you ever feel like happiness is always in front of you? Do you ever set yourself up to be happy when you lose 20 pounds or get a new house or have another baby or get promoted? Do you define success by what you don't have? Do you ever dismiss what you do have because it might not be the because it must not be the gr that great if you have it. Do you ever feel like people are sick of he you hear? Do you ever feel like people are sick of hearing you complain or vent? Experience. Shame is when my husband left me for another woman. My son told me it's because I'm a fat ass. He's only 14 and I don't think he meant it, or at least I hope not. He's just used to hearing it from his father. Plus, he's angry, and maybe he doesn't think it's my fault. Maybe I think it's my fault. Emotions, hurt, loss, anger, fear, grief, self-blame, confused, isolated, and trapped. Dig deep. Have you ever struggled not to blame yourself? Have you ever been the target of somebody's anger and grief? Have you ever had to take care of someone when you could barely take care of yourself? 
Have you ever had a child parrot a, par a partner's insults? Experience. When I made partner in the when I made partner at the law firm, I went into a terrible depression. Everything I'd work for seemed like nothing. Every day I went in to work thinking, oh my God, where are they going to catch on to the fact that I really don't know what I'm doing? I didn't deserve this promotion. I don't deserve the partnership. They're going to find out and I really, it's, they're going to find out I'm really not good. The pressure was so much that I finally had to step down. I don't think people respect me anymore. I just couldn't do it. I just, I don't know if I was really that good and I deserve, I don't know if I was really that good and I deserved it or that I really was never that good and I was faking it. It was just too confusing. Emotions, fear, self-blame, confusion, overwhelmed, isolation, insecure, loss, depression, uh, disappointment. Dig deep. Have you ever felt like an imposter, like people think you are more capable than you really are? Have you ever feared getting caught when you didn't do anything wrong? Have you ever felt the pressure of disappointing yourself, disappointing others or yourself? It is easy to think that it is safer to distance yourself rather than dig for empathy, but as a social worker, Marky McMillan writes, empathy is a gift of validation that no matter how many times it is given, always returns us to our own truth. Empathy heals another at exactly the same time it is healing me. Don't we need a little shame to keep us in line? Another barrier to being empathetic centers around a belief about shame. If we believe that shame is, con is a constructive emotion, we not, may not be interested in being empathetic. We might listen to somebody's experience and think, you should feel ashamed. When I started this research, I wasn't sure about this distinction. I had seen, I had seen drawn between good shame and bad shame. There is a small group of researchers, especially those working from an evolutionary or biologic biological perspective who believe that shame has both negative and positive consequences. The pos positive consequences of shame, they contend, is its ability to serve as a compass for moral behavior. They believe that shame keeps us in line. Seven years of testing this proposition that shame can't be used to change people, combined with a lack of actual data supporting this claim, made me a little suspicious, but I was willing to let the research speak for itself. It didn't take very long for me to reach the conclusion that there is nothing positive about shame. In any form, in any context, and through any delivery system, shame is destructive. The idea that there are two types, healthy shame and toxic shame, did not bear out in any of my research. When I talk to women about the possibility of shame, having positive outcomes or serving as a guidepost for good behaviors, they made it clear that shame is so overbearing and painful that regardless of the intent, it moved, through, it moved them away from being able to grow, change, and respond in any kind of genuine or authentic way. Guilt, on the other hand, was often a strong motivator for change. Again, there are researchers who disagree with this proposition and continue to believe in a concept of healthy shame. But there is now a growing body of evidence against that idea. One of the most comprehensive books on shame research is Shame and Guilt by June Price Tangenier and Rhonda Deering. In it, Tangenier and Deering offer an excellent overview of the shame and guilt literature, and they present some of their ordinary research on these emotions. In a section of their book entitled, Does Shame Serve Any Adaptive Function? Tangenier and Deering explain how early conceptualization of shame may not take may not take into consideration the current way people self-evaluate and relate to one another. They write, with increasingly complex perspective taking and attribute 
attribute abilities, modern humans have the capacity to distinguish between self and behavior, to take another person's perspective, and to emphasize, emphasize with others' distress. Whereas early moral goal, goal centered on reducing potential lethal aggression, clarifying social rank, and enhancing conformity to social norms, modern more morality centers on the ability to acknowledge one's wrongdoing, accept responsibility, and take, reper um, take action. In this sense, guilt may be the moral emotions of the new millennium. If you're interested in additional readings about shame, the distinguish between the distinguishing between shame and guilt and how shame is measured in research, this is an excellent book, though it may feel a little research heavy for some. To help clarify the difference between shame and guilt when it comes to positive behavioral outcome, I'd like to tell you about two important studies described in their book. The first is Tanjani and Deering's eight-year study of moral emotions in which they followed a group of almost 400 children using a measurement instrument that presents potential shaming or guilt eliciting situations they found that shame proneness in fifth graders that is susceptible to shame was a strong predictor of a later school suspension drug use including amphetamines depressant hallucinogenics and heroin and suicide attempts on the other hand, when they compared children who were guilt-prone, the guilt-prone fifth graders were more likely to later apply to college and to be involved in community service. They were less likely to make suicide attempts, use heroin, or drive under the influence of alcohol or drugs, and they began having sex at a later age. The second is a subst substance abuse study conducted by Daring, Stuwig, and Tangineer. The researchers found that when, that when shame proneness increases, substance abuse problems increase. In the same study, they found that guilt proneness may have a protective effect against the development of problematic alcohol and drug use pattern. I've written more about this study in Chapter 9. As we learn more about the positive aspects of guilt, I believe it's important to remember that feeling guilty is only adaptive if we are the ones who are actually responsible for a specific outcome, event, or behavior. Too often in our society, women are blamed when they bear no responsibility and socialized to take responsibility for things they shouldn't. In her book, Changing Course, Healing from Loss, uh, abandonment and fear, Dr. Claude Black refers to this type of guilt as false guilt. She writes, feeling guilty for other people's behaviors and actions is a false guilt. Taking on guilt for things over which we have no control is false guilt. There are enough things in life for which we are responsible and therefore can experience true guilt. Ooh. This is also not a call to raise guilt-prone kids more than anything. These feelings are additional evidence that seriously call into question shame ability to produce good behavior. I think all of us are capable of remembering at a time when we were experiencing profound shame. I can honestly say that, they, that in those moments of shame when I felt rejected, worthless, and degraded, I was far more likely to engage in inappropriate behaviors than I was to choose the healthy behaviors that seem so natural when I'm feeling accepted and good about who I am. When we start to explore the concept that all shame is bad and destructive, it really forces us to reevaluate how we use shame to parent, how we can use shame to fight with partners and on a community and societal level, how we use shame to punish. In a world that still falls back on, you should have been ashamed of yourself, shame on you, have you no shame? The time has come to explore the possibility that we are safer in a world where people aren't mirrored in shame.
To help you think about these concepts, I invite you to compare the following two approaches to working with men who batter their partners. As a social worker, domestic violence is a very important subject to me and one that I spend a lot of my time and energy trying to understand. In Harriet Lerner's book, The Dance of Connection, she tells a story about Ron, a man who punches his wife Sharon in the face and stomach and is forced to attend court-ordered therapy sessions. Dr. Lerner explained that Ron resists being in a group of batterers but is willing and even interested in joining a group of men who have, control, have trouble controlling their anger. Dr. Lerner writes, Ron was resisting the notion that his crime defined him. You might argue that Ron is a batterer and that any language that softens or obscures this fact leaves him less accountable for his actions. But Ron will be more likely to accept responsibility and feel remorse if he can view himself as more than a batterer. For people to look squarely at their harmful actions and to become generally accountable, they must have a platform of self-worth to stand on. Only from the vantage point of higher ground can people who commit harm gain perspective. Only from there can they apologize. Dr. Lerner goes on to explain that refusing to take on an identity defined by one's worst deed is a healthy act of resistance. If Ron's identity as a person is equated with his violent acts, he won't accept responsibility or access genuine feelings of sorrow and remorse, because to do so would threaten him with feelings of worthlessness. Dr. Lerner concludes this section in her book by writing, we cannot survive when our identity is defined by our limited by or limited to our worst behavior. Every human must be able to view the self as complex and multidimensional. When this fact is obscured, people will wrap themselves in layer of denial in order to survive. How can we apologize for something we are rather than something we did? Now, let's contrast Harriet Lerner's thoughts on battering and the need for self-worth to the views of Judge Ted Poe. Judge Poe, who is now a member of the U.S. House of Representatives, has received local and national attention for his shame and humiliation punishment of criminals. In two separate cases, Judge Poe ordered men who assaulted their wives to make public apologies in front of the family law court in downtown Houston. The apologies were delivered in front of hundreds of downtown employees during the lunch break. In an editorial piece written by Poe and published in a Houston Chronicle, Poe defends his actions by writing, let those who have beat their wives steal their neighbor's property and abuse children feel the sting of the community's intolerance, hear their names on our lips, and pay the price in full view of the public. Shame on them or shame on us. I leave you with these questions. If your husband was battering you and he was forced to apologize on the steps of City Hall in front of hundreds of people, would you like to be the woman he comes home to after his day of public shaming? Given what we know about shame and how it affects us, are we safer with him when he's in shame or when he is repairing shame? Are we using shame as a punishment because we think it will foster real change in people? Or are we shaming others because it feels good to make people suffer when we are in fear, anger, or judgment? Developing shame resiliency. Developing shame resiliency, the ability to move towards empathy in the face of shame, is not an easy process. If it were, shame would not be a prevalent and destructive force in our lives. One of the greatest challenges to developing shame resiliency is the way we shame is the way shame actually makes us less open to giving or receiving empathy. Shame protects itself by making it very difficult for us to access its antidote. When we are in shame, reaching out for, for empathy feels very dangerous and risky. And when we are in shame and someone reaches out to us, it is very difficult to dig deep and find anything beyond fear, anger, and blame. As I read through the interviews, I, I, 
as I read through the interviews I conducted with these courageous women, I tried to identify the qualities that helped women develop shame resiliency. Did the women who were successful in overcoming shaming experience have anything, have anything in common? Do the women who are able to give and receive empathy have different information or skills from the women who struggled more with their shame? To answer, the answer to both questions is yes. I found four elements that were shared by all the women who demonstrated the high levels of shame resiliency, and they are, dun, dun, dun. One, the ability to recognize and understand their shame triggers. Two, high levels of critical awareness about their shame web. Three, I'm getting punchy now, can you tell? I don't even like saying that. I'm getting um, silly now because I'm, I've been reading for a while. Um, ooh, an hour and a half. Um, two, high levels of critical awareness about their shame web. Three, the willingness to reach out to others. And four, the ability to speak shame. For the sake of an organized presentation on paper, the four elements are forced into linear order one through four. I'm presenting them in the order that reflects what I've heard most often in the interviews. It's important to understand, however, that this is different from everyone. Some women start with the fourth element of speaking out. Others start with the second or third element. You know yourself best. Please think about the information in this book in the context of your own life and experience, experiences and begin developing resiliency or practicing empathy in the areas we are most comfortable. S success there will likely give you confidence to begin working in the areas you consider more difficult. Additionally, in the chapters described, additionally in the chapters describing the four elements of shame resiliency, I've included some written exam, um, exercises. I've used these exercises with thousands of women. Most find them to be extremely helpful. Start uh, an extremely helpful start to the process. You are welcome to follow along and keep your own journal with the exercises, or you can just read them and think about them. If you go onto the website, um, Brene Brown, you could download the um, exercises, pre-formatted exercises. I have many people tell me that they work through their exercises with a friend, sibling, or with a group of friends. I've talked to many women who read them as part of their group therapy. I actually think working through the process with other people is one of the most effective ways to develop shame resiliency. Sh um, shame happens between people and it heals between people. It should, it's just important that you have some level of trust and confidence in your relationship so you feel safe exploring these ideas. I also think there is a power in writing down our thoughts, reading them, and reflecting on them. All of the exercises were developed with writing in mind. Again, you are welcome to read them and think about them or write them all down. Find a way that is meaningful for you. So that is the end of chapter two. I'm just looking at, and it looks like we go into um, the elements next. So chapter three is a little shorter um, and it talks about the first element um, recognizing shame and understanding our triggers and there's paperwork it sounds like on the website Brene Brown's website that we can um, we can go over so we will continue to discuss this chapter chapter 2 on Friday at 1 o'clock on zoom we get together and we discuss the chapter we'll, we'll um, discuss this chapter for maybe a month um, four Fridays and then I'll read chapter three, and then we'll probably go over some of the exercises that she has written down that we can all talk about when we're together. Again, none of us come together as um, an expert in this. We just come together to discuss how it has an impact on us and how shame has an impact on all of our lives. So I hope that you enjoyed um, the reading out loud. Um, if you want to get the book, um, you can pick up the book and read it yourself, or this will be available on YouTube starting tomorrow, so you can re-listen to some parts of it if you didn't stay for all of it. 
um, and we'll just come together on Friday and discuss certain parts or whatever parts you want to discuss. So I hope you have an amazing day. Um, try to do something um, outside if it starts to dry up. If not, you know, just stay nice and comfy, comfy and do whatever you want today. Thank you so much for listening to me. Um, have a great day and I'll see you soon. Bye.